Well, welcome Shannon and Mike to the Flower Podcast. <laughs> Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, you know, you reached out to me a couple of months ago, which I so appreciate. And I had a lot of fun kind of going on your website and learning about some of the things you guys do. And I was really fascinated. Number one, you guys have been farming for how many years? A long Since time. 90, since 93. 1993. Wow. wow, that's amazing. 29 years, October 1st. No, sorry, August 1st. Just around the corner. So yeah. you guys didn't start off doing flowers. So I'm kind of, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear the story of how you guys started doing what you do and then how and why you sort of transitioned into adding flowers to what you do. Should I go? Yeah, you go ahead. <laughs> so in 1993, when we bought the farm, um, we had a small vegetable garden to start. No children. We had just, just got married. Um, really wanted to farm and grow food. Um, I had always loved flowers and pretty things. We bought the property originally as a place for your three horses. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So it yes. all started with horses. That's fascinating. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we did. We bought it for the horses. So we didn't have to board them. It would be, you know, a little easier on the pocketbook to have them at home. And um, yeah, so we scraped together as young newlyweds. I was 25. And how old would have you been? A few years older. A few years older. A couple years older. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, we we wanted to grow things and in our area here we have something that's called farm status and we wanted to get farm status so it was grow food and started with pumpkins pumpkins yep yep you can maybe mention about the pumpkins yeah we had the little garden plot and a friend came by and laughed at my pumpkin that i'd grown <laughs> A good friend too. Good friend. And uh, <laughs> anyways, so the next year is it's kind of well, I'll show you when you see the pumpkins we grow. So we <laughs> rapidly grad graduated up to like an acre of pumpkins within oh my a, goodness. a year and said, yes. hey, hey, come and laugh at the pumpkins now. <laughs> yeah. So that side of the business grew and growing food slowly grew along with it. And then three little boys. <laughs> came along. So we, we grew the farm and our family at the same time from scratch with wow. nothing. So we just, over the years, Slowly added things bit added by things. bit and uh, tried to pay for things as we went. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think the next big decision was uh, we put in uh, a lavender field, um, which that was fun. <laughs> um, was uh, Something that didn't have to come out in and out of the ground every year it was something that once you had it in and once you had it going, it maintained, it just maintain it. And that worked out pretty good. And uh, the the lavender eventually led more and more to your flower fetish. <laughs> and it's all good. I always love the flowers. And in the midst of it, we added an orchard, a small orchard, and um, we expanded um, into all kinds of vegetables. And uh, um, we're just, uh, we've, we've tried to focus on a bunch of different things uh, mm -hmm. and just develop it over a period of time. So we're quite diverse. Um, the mm -hmm. running joke is you never manage to kill everything in the same year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've never heard that, but that's true. Too. It works really well for us. Like not, nothing ever works 100%, <laughs> right? Um, so if you if you have a whole bunch of different things that you, you know, five or six different things that you focused on, you've got a, a one in five chance of something living <laughs> or something doing well. <laughs> wow. Like right now, we're, we're very thankful this year that we've got um, a greenhouse and that we do have the lavender because right now we're eight weeks behind. It's so wet here right it's now. It's very we, wet. We've though. lost our first two plantings of corn. Uh, we yeah. just haven't been able to get into a field and get them in the ground. Um, I worked till dark all, all nights last week because it was starting to dry out. And then we had torrential rains for the last two days. So um, right now you can't even walk through the fields that I just finished getting ready. 
Mm -hmm. So the diversity of our farm allows us to kind of right now weather the storm. <laughs> the fortunate thing we have right now, and we need to, you know a link to sanity, is we've got an acre of garlic out back that we can look at. It looks really good. It right looks now. amazing this year. Wow. Nice so you keep saying like an acre of pumpkins and an acre of garlic, and so how much land do you guys have? We've only got twenty acres. We're 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 too small to be big and too big to be small. Yeah, it's kind of an awkward space for us. We're using tractors um, for a lot of the work. Um, then we do a lot of, you know, hand, hand planting, hand weeding. Um, we yeah. have some permanent gardens. We rotate yeah. crops. We rotate crops. Uh, we do not believe in herbicides and pesticides, so we've avoided that for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of specialized uh, by going into um, biodegradable mulches. Um, so that's okay. really, really helped with controlling um, environments and beds for planting things like flowers and pumpkins. And, and we even actually do one that nobody else, I think, has ever done in this area is we actually plant corn in raised biodegradable mulched beds. Okay, so I've got to ask, because I know I'm channeling somebody out there listening right now. <laughs> um, what do you mean by biodegradable mulched beds? So we have a machine that, that makes a, a bed. Um, so a raised bed. A raised bed we, and we can go anywhere from three inches to seven inches. And uh, we use a starch-based mulch that comes in rolls. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that is biodegradable. So we don't have to pull it off at the end of the season. And uh, by doing that, um, we get that initial weed barrier when stuff first goes in the ground. Um, if the ground is on the wet side and it's a wet year, if you can get the plastic down, it helps keep further moisture out. Mm -hmm. If it's a dry year and you've got some moisture, it actually helps hold the moisture in. Mm -hmm. And we actually run drip tape underneath the uh, the plastic mulch, so we try and make a little micro environment in each bed. Um, the pros for it is is uh, tremendous savings in labor with respect to um, weeding and initial plant maintenance. Uh, you've got that environmental control by being able to irrigate at will if it's hot and help mm -hmm. repel the water if it's wet. Um, the downside of it is um, is machine time, and you've got to have uh, fairly dry conditions to lay the mulch, um, mm -hmm. and cost, of course. It's expensive. It's not cheap. Well, neither is labor, and, and also... No. Uh, Every the, yeah. Everything has its pros and cons. Mm -hmm. sure, sure. The con this year is it's so wet, um, we we don't have a hope of laying a bed for a few days right now. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're in limbo a little bit right now. Well, and I want to talk about that a little bit. But before we leave the mulch, I have to ask this question. I do. You, this may seem like a silly question. Do you use black or white film when you're for that bio mulch? We use black. Yeah. Okay. Because for us. Um, we're trying to get in the ground as early as possible, so we want to gain that heat that's okay. generated by the black. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because um, I, I know down here, well, I know down here, I know some people that use the white version, like with their dahlias and things, because mm -hmm. it helps not, I guess, reflect some of that. I don't know if that's good or not, yes. though, but mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah, yeah. We, use, we use black. We plant all our annual flowers with that as well. Okay, cool. That's interesting. So I know, I mean, I've been listening to peony farmers and uh, people that sell like blooming lilac branches, things like that up in the Pacific Northwest. And I know where you guys are located just across, I don't know how far into Canada you are. Um, are, are you near the border or are you much farther north? We are about 350 miles northwest of the Canada-US border. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. So the your Vancouver Island. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So I just I've been hearing everybody, Washington, Oregon, you know, is behind uh like by four to five weeks, depending on what the crop is and where they are, because it's just been so cool and wet. Um yeah. 
are you guys just trying to ride it out or is there anything you have been able to do to kind of just help the process at all? Well, the, the first, <laughs> the first one is, is the diversity thing comes in, right? Because sure. we've got greenhouses, we have permanent stuff like lavender. We have stuff that's been in the ground already since mm -hmm. October in the, in the form of garlic. Um, so that is kind of an ace in the hole. We have um, Shannon's permanent flowers that have all come up and stuff that we got in in the fall. Um, we, we actually, last week was the soul searching week. We just, yeah, we, we were we, wondering. We just, we almost pulled the pin on the whole season um, because we're taking a big gamble. We, we've just actually went and started another, I'm going to guess 15,000 pumpkin and squash seedlings on yeah. a field that I can't get a tractor into, but we're, uh, we're if it suddenly dried out, <laughs> if it suddenly dried out in, in a week and we don't have anything started, we're beat anyways. So we're, we're taking the financial gamble and hoping that uh, we're going to pull it off. Wow. What percentage would you say your farm is of flowers versus more vegetables? 15% flowers would be my guess. Yeah, probably 15% flowers. Actually, if we roll the lavender in, it's 20 there's okay. about um, 2,000 lavender plants. Oh. And then we have gardens around the farmhouse with like add, permanent peonies. Uh, and if we had the lavender off, we got about an acre and a half of lavender. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's very diversified here. <laughs> no, but that's great. I mean, it's great for lots of reasons, especially since you, you know, don't use pesticides and things like that. I mean, it's, it's good to have all that, that diversity, I think. Also, I'm thinking with all of this rain though, you know, down here in the South with the heat and even though I'm really thrilled to see more people growing lavender, um, I would think that with all this rain, um, does the lavender, is it raised up enough that it doesn't have the same impact by all the water or is it uh, by nature here? Well? Mm -hmm, yeah. By nature here, we're in a wet area. Um, so everything that we've planted in lavender has been in raised beds. Oh, and nice. what, we've, what we've done with every raised bed, we've made sure that we've, um, we've laid drip tape with the bed. Mm -hmm. And to date, touch wood, um, we, we <laughs> have yet to ever irrigate lavender. It, it inherently yeah. likes dry. It, it does really well. It's pretty forgiving. So our field, when it's planted, we'll water it in maybe the first year and then it doesn't get water. Last year we had a heat dome here. So we got up to 40 degrees. It was hot and dry. We, we saw heat last year like we've, we've never, never seen, seen here, here before. before. So wow. lavender did great. This year they seem to be fine. Um, we got down to minus 10 at the win winter. Last winter, I haven't lost any lavender yet. So they're pretty forgiving. Right. For everyone listening, this is Celsius because in Canada, they don't have to live by Fahrenheit down. Like we do down here. So don't be freaking out at minus 10 <laughs> or, or, or a warm spell of 40 degrees. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, how high do you, with the raised beds with the lavender, I'm curious, like how high do you have those raised beds? Um, picture they're, they're, they're a rounded bed. Sure. And um, in, in an area that's lower, uh, I went as high as just about a foot above ground level at, okay. the, at the peak. Mm -hmm. And then the areas that are better drained and um, more level, uh, we're talking about a six inch raised bed. Okay. Well, and I'm glad you made that distinction because for people who've never grown it or have had hard times growing it, I feel like that's a big help understanding okay, your soil and the way it likes to be dry and, and helping it drain and things. I yep. also wonder too, do, um, do you guys give, I've seen a lot of growers, you know, you cut your flowers, you cut, um, you know, the blooms and things like that. Do you go back and do you have to give it like a haircut to kind of get it restarted for next year? Or do you get a rebloom from it? How does that work with you guys? That's you. <laughs> So we, we do trim it back um, a fair bit, I would say. Um, early in the spring, I will cut it back, or late winter, I will cut it back um, like February, late February, if it needs it. And then it will bloom 
the English Angustifolia lavender blooms first for us is mid June to end of June, except for this year, because everything's behind, as you said. Right. I think we're about seven weeks for us here on our farm right now. Um, we're yeah, talking we're, July at this point now. Yeah, right? I don't know what's going to happen. They're actually just, the lavender is just starting to send up its stems with the little flowers on the end, just oh. starting to green up. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll cut it. Um, first we cut it for culinary use, then we cut for dried, then we cut for fresh. Um, and then at the end of the season, I'll cut it again if it needs it. Sometimes it does get two blooms. It depends on the weather here. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. I wouldn't have thought, I would have thought you would have cut for fresh before, for, before dried. Why, why do you do that? So you want to make sure that the lavender buds don't fall off for fresh and you want them nice and open too. If you're using them for um, like floral work or selling them um, to brides to do, you know, their own. So yeah, you have to make sure that the buds don't fall off. So what we do is I'll go through and I'll look at the field in the row and when two or three little flowers have started to open, that's when I'm going to cut for dried because when I dry it, I don't want those coming off. And then for, for wedding work, it'll be maybe two weeks later. You want it kind of open. Um, so it looks really pretty, but once again, they're not going to fall off or that the stem's not going to droop. And then, um, and then the final cut is for oil. We also distill our own essential oil. So we wait till the flowers are really mature. Um, and then it's our oil production that we do. Now, do you use that to make other products? Yes. So we have a copper still, um, it's steam. And we, we do fresh cut lavender and dried lavender. So in the winter, we can actually do a lot of distilling with the dried buds. And in wow. the summer, it's fresh. Yes. We've actually found over the years that um, drying the lavender and then stripping the buds and distilling the buds gives a pure, more extreme essential oil because Beautiful. you don't have all what comes with the stock and the rest of it mixed in when you're distilling. So we what don't a distill great this, tip. You know, we don't yeah. distill the stems and pieces with the dried, it's the pure flower bud. And it's quite noticeably uh, the difference in oil production too. Mm -hmm. um, doing the whole plant versus just the buds. Of course, like anything, it's a compromise. Um, if you sit down and figure out the labor involved mm -hmm. to hang it all, to dry it, then to strip the buds and then store the buds versus just cut the plant off and throw it in the distiller, uh, it, it's really, really labor heavy. Mm -hmm. Wow. I can't even imagine what's involved with picking the, the dried flowers off. <laughs> yeah, and we're, we're actually picking and bundling those by hand. We've got an amazing crew of mostly young ladies that work here with us. Um, some have been here for quite a long time and we're really grateful for their help and, and they know how to do everything the same as we do. They're fantastic. So yeah, that's all done by hand. And then when we get the oil and the hydrosols, I make products with that. So we have like a lavender soap. Um, we also have a herd of Nubian goats. So I milk the goats. And then I make a goat milk soap with our lavender in it and our goat milk. Wow. Wow. And how many goats do you have? Do you know? Too many. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard because we have goats and we also grow vegetables and we have an orchard and goats love apple orchards. Anything goats that the love goats shouldn't eat, flowers. the goats will eat first. <laughs> how do they know? I'm, on, I'm yeah. on a campaign actually here trying mm -hmm. to get people to catch on to goat burger. <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my gosh. I cannot believe you said that, but I love it. That's hilarious. Yeah. Um, that's so funny. Well, okay. So flowers, veggies, goats. So <laughs> I mean, you guys are doing it all. So you started, if I remember from our conversation before, you started really getting into flowers around, was it 2000? 2002. Two. That's all right. Okay. Don't we put the lavender in? Yeah. Um, well, truthfully, it happened because my father passed away rather traumatically. And so it was right. healing for me, the flower. Yeah, totally understand. I, I think that's 
we find that to be true for a lot of people. So that's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, started with lavender. You. Started with the lavender and then adding, you know, the peony garden and then adding all the annual flowers and then adding the edible flowers. And it kind of... <laughs> Oh my God! I'm driving yeah. crazy because it's just flowers, flowers, flowers it, now. We we do a plant sale every year, so we do a huge pile of tomato starts. Yeah. <laughs> every time I turned around for a few years, she found somebody that she was trading away our tomato starts for peonies. Or or the, I say dahlias for the dahlias. And the dahlias. <laughs> I, More I mean, that's not a bad trade, I don't think. Oh, I'll trade anything for flowers <laughs> but i'm just saying at least you're trading for something that produces year after year after year um oh, yeah, that's, yeah that's hilarious exactly i love yeah. that well i'm so okay so you just you just brought up a topic that i have had uh, more than one request about and that is edible flowers and so um i'm just kind of wondering a couple lots of things about it but why did you start doing it? How did you start doing it? And how do you decide what to grow for it? So I am fairly new to the edible flowers Okay. in one way. In one way, I'm not. So the lavender obviously is edible. And I quickly discovered how amazing lavender was. You know, I make a lavender lemonade and there's lavender gelato and lavender shortbread cookies and lavender cake. And I mean, lavender can go into so many things. Um, and then I started thinking with a couple of the young ladies that work here, um, well, we can do nasturtiums, which we've grown for bouquets, but nasturtiums are edible. Um, calendula is edible. There's all these beautiful edible flowers. And then last year, um, we worked with an amazing local chef, Marc Andre from Dubois, and we were providing him with vegetables for his restaurant. And he started asking for edible flowers. So I thought, perfect, <laughs> we can do that. So yeah, we, we had uh, snapdragons for him and stock for him. And then now I'm, I'm looking at the farm so differently, like there's strawberry flowers here and thimbleberry flowers. And like the list is endless if you just look around the farm and see what there is. Yes, because that's the other thing I'm like, does when a chef asks you that question, does he already know what he wants? Because I'm like thinking, for example, I had someone say they were, I forget, this has been a couple of years and they were growing something for being an edible flower. And I thought, well, I'll try one. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it was awful. It was just awful. And I thought, I mean, it just tasted so bitter. And I thought to myself, how do they know? So that's why I was wondering, like, I mean, lavender, you can kind of imagine, um, and nasturtiums I've tried because I know it's kind of a peppery taste. I was just curious, you know, how did you come up with your list? Was it trial and error? Or did the chef kind of dictate it? Well, so Mark Andre uses it more like on his, he plates his, his meals absolutely beautifully. I can't even explain. Could you explain what his food is like? It is like art. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And the taste is phenomenal. Like it's so nice being growers of food to give your, your vegetables and your edible flowers to a chef who can truly turn it into he doesn't take like the ingredients and try and turn them into something yeah. else he turns mm. the ingredients he, he finds the good points of the ingredients and complements them mm -hmm. so what i would do for him because i know he likes the um the look of it as well i would we would be tasting the flowers in the field but the, um like this, the snapdragons were absolutely beautiful, the Chantilly ones. And, and it's oh, easy yeah. for him because I could give him some big stalks of snaps. He'll put it in the walk-in cooler and just, you know, pick off the, the actual flowers that he wanted and, and plate his meals as needed. So, yeah, some flowers, I mean, don't taste the best, but I guess mixed in with the other food, it's beautiful. <laughs> well, the, And that's it. I think a lot of times it's all about the beauty. Um, yeah. and that, so do you sell to other people? I mean, I know you said you're just starting out with it or do you just have mainly one customer for it? So the edible flowers has been just, um, Mark Andre with Dubois. And then here I actually put them in bouquets <laughs> all the time. So that's what I'm doing. So I love having sure. like, um, strawberries. I was picking the Alpine mignonette strawberries yesterday and putting them in some bouquets and picking like the hot pink 
um, berry basket flowers and putting those in bouquets. If people want to eat them, go ahead. Um, and then the farmer's market. We actually go to a, a beautiful, amazing farmer's market here in our, in our town. And we have sold them there as well. But yes, we're just starting out with that. Other than lavender, lavender's always been a big one for culinary. We sell it by the pound. And we're wow. selling to um, donut shops and gelato shops and bakeries for that. And we have a lavender opening <clears throat> once a year for, mm -hmm. for a week. Um, so that moves a lot of stuff too. It does move a lot of stuff. Selling direct to the customer when the farm is open. And we'll have edible flowers available at those events as well for, for people. So having your farm open, how often do you, or how many times a year do you do that? Is it once or is it? We've varied a little bit, but we seem to have been settled the last couple of years at three times a year. Okay. Seasonally three times. Yeah. A plant sale in the spring. And then in the summer, it's our lavender and flower event. And I think last year it was a week. Yep. Yeah, seven days. Um, the community comes in. We, we get the farm cleaned up. <laughs> it makes us <laughs> sort things up and make it look a little better than it usually is. Um, yeah, we're open for weekend. There's no charge for that. Um, people love coming in and seeing all the dried flowers hanging in the barn and seeing the wall of lavender and seeing us harvest vegetables, you know, right there where they're driving in and... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and then in the fall, do you do something like at pumpkin time or? Yeah, we have our, our annual pumpkin harvest and uh, we're open for the month of October. Oh, wow. The entire month. Wow. Every day. Yeah. Wow. Every day the community has been coming here for, yeah, we're lucky. Our community is fantastic. They always come and support us and other farmers. So. That's great. How, you know, I'm curious, how do you, why do you think they do that? How do you, how did you connect with your community? I know a lot of times when people are starting new things and trying to, to build those bridges, um, you know, it's kind of different for everybody because it depends on what you're selling and what you're doing. And I'm just curious what you um, found worked for you. Persistence. Yeah. <laughs> it's, with what though? Consistency. Um, we've been doing it a long time. It a didn't start time. out that way. It's uh, It's been built one little piece at a time. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because a lot of times people think it's an overnight process. Like, you know, no. you just stumbled into this and it's like, no, it doesn't work that way. Anything but I was just... Any, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say anything that has any substance is not an overnight process. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Well, and I, and I think too... I guess what I'm curious about is, is there something you felt like worked better, whether it was social media, whether it was just leaving samples, whether it was your, you know, restaurants you sell to, or maybe at your farmer's markets, like, or maybe remember. it was all of it. Hmm? You got to remember we started this social media <laughs> didn't really exist. <laughs> I remember. I remember. Oh my gosh. How, how I forget <laughs> this. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm like, are you kidding? You yeah, mean there was farming there. before social media? I'm just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> did we even have a computer back then? Uh, <laughs> I don't think we did. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. <laughs> so even better. So how did you, like, I'm just wondering, you know, how did you start connecting? Was it at markets? No, we didn't do the markets back then. We, we've only been doing farmer's markets for, I think this is our fourth year. We did yeah. that backwards. Um, um, we actually started out wholesale. We're, we're wholesale for a bit, yep. We started out wholesale, and in reality, the first time we opened was in October, and it was a sign on the side of the road. That's, okay. That was basically it. Word of uh, mouth, I guess. Yeah, and, uh, Word of mouth. In fact, I remember our, our first year that we connected and started some wholesale and had our, our first opening, and we were, were so excited. Uh, I think we made fifteen hundred dollars in the month of October, and that's how it began. That was, that was the beginning. Yeah, yeah. you got to start somewhere. That's right. No, that's awesome. I love that. I'm curious. You've been growing flowers for a while now. How do you decide what you grow? How do I decide what I grow? I always like to be like growing something that no one else is growing. Um, I remember a few years, I saw these beautiful purple bell flowers in a photo in a, I don't, I don't even know where it was. Um, 
might have been a catalog, a seed catalog, probably. I'm like, I've got to grow those. And that was the, the cathedral bells or copia. I'm like, I have to grow that. So I grew them and they were wildly popular. And then um, another year, what was it? Uh, the China asters, I grew those and I'd never grown them before and they were beautiful. And I just go visually with what I think will you know, be beautiful and maybe no one else will be growing and that the florist that we work with would love. Um, there's an amazing florist in town here that um, actually contacted us. She just phoned up uh, about seven years ago, six years ago. I can't quite remember. Yeah, can't. The, the years seem to just flow. Um, All good. Yeah, and and she she would basically buy anything we would grow. And sometimes she she'd give me ideas. Now you know she'd like this or that. Um, but yeah, I just try things. I am um, Lysianthus I did just because I thought, oh, everyone says they're hard to grow from seed. I can do that. I've been growing for a long time. So I gave it a go. It was fine. I don't grow them anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh, these take a long time. <laughs> Left on moderate, you should try everything. I do. Mike's really good though, because he's, um, how can I explain? I keep us from going broke. Yes, he does. Because somebody, somebody doesn't <laughs> buy everything in the seed catalog. So the amount of time it was taking me to grow the Lysiantha seeds and, you know, the heat and the light and the and the time and the every, if you do like the enterprise enterprise budget and see actually what I was getting for those flowers at the end, it, it wasn't worth it for us. So sure. I, I cut those out and they weren't my favorite either for some odd reason. Um, yeah, so I just kind of go on my gut with what to grow, what grow, what I think will grow really well here, um, what I love growing, what I like working with, what I think that the florist that we work closely with would like. Um, I get the job of being the realist. And he's the realist. <laughs> it's like, oh, we got $20 for those. It only cost us 50 to grow them and harvest them. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's how the universe stays balanced. Exactly. So exactly. It's all good. It's all good. You win some, you lose some, right? That's yeah. right. Uh, hopefully you win more than you lose. That's the, exactly. that's the goal. Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes a draw is okay. Yeah, that's right. You did great with tulips this year. Yeah, you did. <laughs> you did really good with I the tulips. I did very good with the tulips this year. They were fantastic. I loved growing them. Growing them. So now do you grow? Okay. So that, of course, leads to another question. With you being where you are in the country, um, what, like, I don't know how cold it gets. I don't know what your seasons are like. Do you grow all of those winter, like anemones or ranunculus or tulips? Do you grow them all in the greenhouse or do you do anything in the field? Pretty much everything's 100% field grown for flowers. Wow. Field grown. And actually the ranunculus this year, we planted um, the corms in October. October. It was an experiment. I'm always experimenting and trying to push the limit of flowers and what, what I've been told or what I've researched they can do and see. So planted the ranunculus without pre-sprouting in October in the pouring rain, in the muck. No, I didn't plant no, all we of did, them. We did get the plastic down and make a seed bed. Oh, that's so right. We did the seed the, bed. They were in the muck, <laughs> but they were protected. Yes, they were protected a bit under a tree. But they also had the plastic on. And them. plastic, um, and, but those went through minus ten degrees Celsius this winter, and the wet and the cold, and they did amazing. So I wouldn't, I didn't think they would, but they did. So yeah, actually, that's did awesome. Better than the ones that were in the greenhouse, yeah. In pots. Yes, we did some in the greenhouse in pots. That was another experiment. Um, not doing that again. <laughs> they didn't work out as great as I thought. They bloomed and they were they were early, so first market, but um, they weren't up to the standards that I like. So sure. I won't do those again. So I wanted to go back. You said you sold a florist. So maybe can you break down who you sell your flowers to? Like I don't know if it's mostly florists or now you're now you said you're doing markets and just curious. So the flowers first, the first and the best ones always go. I, I'll let the florist know that we work with one, one florist, um, Ariana. She's Fifth Street florist. I'll let her know what we have blooming and um, see if she wants any first. And I'll make sure she gets the prime of the prime flowers for that. Um, then I make um, bouquets for orders. I haven't had them on our website lately. I have in the past where people can order, you know, a bouquet and I'll put it together and it's next day pickup at the farm. Um, lately, it's been 
social media requests, like direct messages, um, phone call and email orders, um, regular customers that just keep wanting the flowers. However, that being said, um, the bulk of the sales are the, the farm stand yeah, and well, the I'm farmer's market. Yeah, we take them to the farmer's market and that's been great for us. And then at the end of our driveway, at the farm, we have a roadside farm stand that runs on the honor system. So it's cash or e-transfer. And that gives me and um, a couple of the young ladies that work here that do the flowers with me, we can just make whatever bouquets we want, put them out with a price tag at the farm stand and, they, and they're sold that way. And they generally all go? They all go sold out yesterday. That's so amazing. Sunday, so. Yeah, yeah no, that's kind great. Of, yeah, I let people know, you know, there's flowers out there. I try and keep it as consistent as possible. And, and then yeah. the other thing that really helps is our area town has expanded and moved significantly towards us. So we have a very, very busy road in front of our place that the farm stands on. Mm -hmm. So that, that makes a, a huge impact on things. Yeah, absolutely. What a difference foot traffic makes, or at least, you know, driving by traffic um or whatever you call that um <laughs> i i yeah i i you know i often wondered and i don't know that i've ever asked this question before on the podcast but when you have the farm stand or the market that you take bouquets to um how do you decide like what you grow to put in there like do you deliberately plan certain crops thinking oh this is going to be great filler for the bouquet or something i mean i'm just kind of curious your process on that so i just think seasonally and i guess very lucky or you know thankful that we've been here for so long and we've got a lot of um like things that i can pick and just forage forage on the farm so we're picking um nine bark and and lilac and um the peony and just everything i have enough here for whatever i need so right now we have the ranunculus blooming and i'm putting huckleberry and raspberry um with them um yeah there's there's always something here and it's all seasonally inspired when we're doing the bouquet so there's really no like, like real thought to just seasons you know what is blooming and what we've got we've got hedgerows here um so there's a lot to pick from that's just growing. That's great. That's great. Blackberries. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. Of blackberries. And, and what I and love use, about it, go ahead. I'll, I'll use it all and I'll try it all. So I have yeah. to keep her under control with our apple tree blossoms. Yeah. <laughs> apple trees and um, pear, <laughs> pear and plum, all of those blooms can go in all the bouquets. Yeah. And I'm really bad too, because I'm like, you can cut them when they're flowering. You can cut them when they have little tiny fruits on them and they're just so yeah. cute. You can cut them in the fall foliage. And by the time Christmas comes, there's like, no, where's the trees? I mean, it's like all snubs yeah. out there. Yeah. So, um, now I was just curious, cause I know that you plant, you, I mean, I know you have your gardens with your perennials and things like that, but I'm sure you also plant annuals and things like that. Like summer annuals. Like I heard you mentioned dahlias earlier. Well, yeah. which isn't really an annual, but I'm just trying to think of, you know, crops like you might plant for that. And, and maybe, maybe, maybe it's just, you do solid bouquets of things. I wasn't sure. Yeah. So I do a lot of, a lot of annuals. Um, so just, you know, the, the zinnias and tons of sunflowers and the dahlias and, oh my gosh, there's, I mean, a huge list, all the annuals we grow. Um, Lots of sunflowers. I, I love sunflowers, sunflowers because <laughs> minimum labor. <laughs> Big flower. Labor. We don't want them that big though. They like them smaller. <laughs> but and great return too. I mean, because yes. exactly. Yeah. 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 And they're also sunflowers are blooming. Usually we can time them perfectly. So the first ones are coming out when the farm is open for our lavender and our flower, you know, open house for the public. So we can sell all those sunflowers and even more. And then they the rest usually open. carry through till the end of October. Yeah, we keep succession planting them. So we've got them right through till october so how often because of where you're at and your day length and things how often are you planting crops of sunflower this year 
<laughs> None. <laughs> so, usually. <laughs> We're not talking about this year. No, we actually have some. We have some planted. They're just not quite in the field right now, and they should be. Um, so we do succession planting. I'll start them off in um, the 72 trays in, oh gosh, probably, I think, May, May, beginning of May, May 1st. And then just keep going every week, plant another every tray, week. plant another tray. And then usually we're planting them in the fields. We've got a transplant water wheeler that we, you know, plant with and we space them nice and close and and just get them, you know, every week we'll be planting sunflowers. Sure, sure. Yeah, and in a normal season, the tractor doesn't stop very often. It's we're either prepping a field or planting a field. Planting. We start April last year, it was a normal ish year. April 12th, we can get in the field. And then I'm um, usually middle of October is when October 20th is when we have our first frost. And that'll take out quite a few things. Sure. So it's a fairly long growing year. It's not and, bad. And I'm assuming because of where you're at, and this is my own ignorance, that you end up having to dig the dahlias every year? Yes. 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 We dig them out usually November because October when our farm is open to the public, it's just far too busy. We can't cope sure. with anything else. So we cross our fingers. It's not too muddy <laughs> and we can get into the field. But yeah, we go in and we dig them all out and then um, clean them up. Last year, we divided them right then and there and stored them and then, yeah, plant them again. Right now, they're ready to go in the field, but they haven't gone in yet because it's, it's too muddy. So I've actually got them started in trays and I'll transplant them out when it's a little drier, hopefully soon because it's getting late. Sure. Well, and, you know, I wanted to ask this question when um, I was just learning more about how you guys began in the process and the evolution of your farm. Um, a lot of people out there that grow vegetables are entertaining the idea of growing more and more flowers, or they're just wanting to start with that process. And so sometimes we have listeners even that are new to flower farming. Was there anything tricky for you in transitioning from vegetables? Cause you had done it for so many years before I mean, yeah, you may have had flowers, but you, you've you done it for a long time before you jumped into flowers with the lavender. Um, so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts or, or suggestions with that process of transitioning. Well, I know I find the vegetables easier. I don't know if that's just because I've been growing them for so long, but I find sometimes the seed requirements for germination on the flowers, you have to know, do they like light? Do they like dark? Do they like warm sure. do they like cool do they you know are they going to bloom the second year the first year um yeah you have to really nail down your your seed requirements and what those seeds need to germinate and get going so yeah yeah no i mean that's a great point vegetables to me are a lot easier but yeah. at the same time i think for me like when i've had best big vegetable gardens i never was like a full-scale farmer but i had a pretty good sized garden um I feel like you have to be out there picking and everything like almost every day to keep things blooming or, you know, you're, you can't just let, you know, on a flower, you may have the privilege of cutting it maybe once a week or twice a week, depending on the crop. Um, if it's poppies or something ridiculous, you may be out there every 30 minutes cutting, but I'm just, you know, I'm just curious. Um, was there anything as far, cause when you were vegetable growers, just vegetable growers, were you doing that organically without pesticides and things too? Yes. We don't use pesticides, herbicides at all on our farm. That's awesome. Never. And then when you transitioned into flowers, did you notice any different pests or anything like that, that pressure, but because you were doing it, you probably already had plenty of beneficial insects. I, I like, well, we have hives here too. There's. Wow. How many beehives? Yeah, around 40. About 40 beehives. <laughs> so pollination has never been a problem here. That being said, some of the flowers, I don't want to have them pollinated because then those flower petals are going to start dropping. So, right. um, but we've never had um, a pest problem. And if anything, I think having the flowers here really helps the vegetables. I think growing them together, um, I think is really beneficial. I think the fact that we rotate everything regularly is a huge help. And that too. Yep. Occasionally, we will have a run of something. Um, like every few years, we'll get a run of cutworms. 
Mm -hmm. And um, generally speaking, what we chose to do is just let them run their course because they're going to they're going to stick around for a couple three weeks and they're going to take some plants out. But if you if you figure out the damage of, of the pesticides and even just the sheer cost of it, it doesn't make any sense on the mm -hmm. short term or the long term. Um, aphids last year was were never seen aphids like ever. It was phenomenal <laughs> uh, on Brussels sprouts and kaolettes, um, yeah, just, just completely covered. crawling. And we, we did some research and we lucked out. We found a mineral oil. Um, so it's completely non-toxic. Um, it's not bad for the environment, certified organic. And um, you, you just give them a, a, every few days a spray with that. And I think we did that uh, oh, about three times. And things got down to an acceptable level. It's like we have kind of a threshold with the bugs. Yeah. After, like we'll, we'll lose um, a few things and then... We have uh, occasionally we'll have a crazy season of uh, tent caterpillars. And um, we've, we've come across a certified organic product called Dipel, which is mm -hmm. a naturally occurring enzyme and it only affects the guys that eat the leaves. So it doesn't bother the bees or any of the creepy crawlers that you want around. Um, so generally what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll manually take out the 10 caterpillars. And if, we, if we're, we're losing the battle, then we'll try around a dipel and it, it does the job. And we don't have to use it again. That's so great. That's the only things that come to mind that we actually have used and... Mm -hmm. um, and we do rotate everything a lot too. We're always so, moving our fields, growing something new. Last year's flower field now has giant pumpkins in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, the flower annual flower field we're moving into now. Last year had uh, was uh, it? Had, beans were over there, I think. Had beans. Yeah, we're moving things. Greens, broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage last year was in that field. I think so yeah. So I'm glad you brought this up because we've never talked about this before on the podcast. When rotating, like, I'm curious if you don't mind sharing. I know it's probably hard without, you know, doing it on audio only, but um, how do you do that? Like, do you divide your property into, I'm just curious if you can explain the method, methodology behind rotating. I understand why, but sort of how you approach it. Um, we, we approach yeah. it a lot by just the geography of the property. Um, so okay. we can pretty much cut it into uh, six different main blocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> we just do a shuffle every year, trying to figure out, um, okay, we had this year last year, uh, let's put it this year. And what can we put there? And what was here before this that it doesn't like? And we do a, a big pile of plotting every single year. I think we've been growing here for so long now, like it's almost been three decades that we just, we just kind of know where things go <laughs> and what was there last year and what was there five years ago. And garlic is a big one. We Garlic's can't, the hardest one. Yeah. We need to have it definitely rotated quite a few years between. Yeah. We, we shoot so. for five years between having garlic in the same spot. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, there's a mold that mm. garlic gets. White rot white rot and it, it it's a five-year cycle to break mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't get it and touch wood we've mm -hmm. never had it and, and we've grown garlic a very long we, time we want to make sure we don't so we're really really careful about trying to keep the, that timeline in there and it's uh that's a hard one mm -hmm. yeah so do you with your six plots do you then rotate everything where like nothing's playing, everything gets into that same slot like once every six years, or do you follow it that regimentally? Because maybe certain areas do better because it's shadier or, or more better drainage or something. It depends on the year. Um, it's, it's not a perfect system. Every so mm -hmm. often we will wind up, you know, geez, we didn't make um, a big separation this year. Uh, okay, we might have moved pumpkins 
um, from this field to, geez, we don't have a place for the squash. We really mm -hmm. don't want to follow the pumpkins with squash, right. but we don't have a choice. Yeah. So we get a variation. At least it's something a little different. It's not the same crop back in the same spot. Mm -hmm. um, so no, nothing's perfect. I understand. Do you ever, do you take, do you ever take like one of the areas and then just plant cover crops for a year? Just to help? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good. We try and leave at least one field blank every year. We've always been big proponents of cover crops and fallow fields as well. Which yeah. is getting uh, harder because I keep adding more yeah, vegetables and flowers <laughs> to the mix. Yeah, and then the fallow field will usually run a mix of um, uh, winter peas, um, fescus, um, clover. Clover. Um, traditionally, we've used red, um, but we've actually got a big bag of yellow that we're going to experiment with to see. Because uh, apparently the bees really like the yellow better than the red. Um, what else is in there? Fall rye. So we, we actually make a blend of our own cover crop. Yeah, so do yeah. you, um, and I'm sorry to ask, uh, hopefully I'm not boring anybody out there, no. but when you, when you do that, do you have like a fall cover crop you plant and then a spring one, or do you just plant one and then it just sort of naturalizes for the year? Um, we generally don't get our cover crop on until the spring. It's usually okay. by the time we st we're starting to wind things down here in October and it's have the November. ability to do it, it's too wet. And it's, mm. yeah, it's, November. it's November. So it's usually first thing we can get out in the spring, the cover crop goes on. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. that's there till the next spring or is that? That's right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, that makes sense. I'm, the, I'm so entrenched being in the Southeast, uh, Southeastern United States. <laughs> Where, you know, there's a fall cover crop or depending on when the land's empty, you know, there's a right. spring cover crop. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, but that makes perfect sense. And I, I just, um, I just feel like it adds so much back to the soil and the diversity and the, just the organic matter. I mean, I just think it's, it's really great. I'm, I'm glad that you didn't mind sharing that list of treats that you plant on it. Um, I think, I think with the cover crops too, it's kind of nice because Mike's always said you can't keep taking from the soil, you've got to give back. So that's what the cover crop does. Absolutely. Well, I was curious, um, going back to you selling to florists and things, um, what, are, what are your number one sellers to flower shops? Number one, ranunculus. Okay. Tulips, um, peonies, that's number one. <laughs> Peonies. Actually, you know what? They when they're in season, they all do a lot. Sweet peas do huge. Sweet peas do really well. Yep, yep. They're all pretty the, good. Do you grow I, those like, in the field? Do you grow sweet peas in the field or the greenhouse? Yes, yes. Traditionally, we've done like hundred foot rows of sweet peas. Okay, I'm nauseous now. I'm they, sorry. they grow real. They grow beautifully <laughs> here. I'm sorry. <laughs> and they're it's good okay. crop. They, they, uh, they're, they're a good crop. They're really, really good for the soil. And yeah. I know the florists, you can, you can use, yeah, it's good for the soil. And then the florists, it's not only the flowers, it's the beautiful vines and the tendrils. And yeah, I love them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm glad you shared that. Well, I, uh, you know, as we wrap up, I always love to ask my advice question of the piece of advice that you would want to, and it could be something that someone gave to you or something you want to share with our listeners. And, you know, when we have a married couple, it's always great because we get two for one, right? <laughs> Can I go first? Sure. <laughs> I was going to let you give the advice. I don't even know what you'd say. Are you afraid? <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I just think experiment and... I've noticed with the farm here, just my advice would be just to open your eyes at what you have growing already. Like this year, I've never used my pear tree blossoms. And I'm like, why not? Why haven't I, I, not, I don't know why I hadn't used them. So yeah, pear and blackberry and um, anything. It, you can just experiment, try new things. Even if you've been doing it for a long time like us, there's always new things to learn. Yeah, mm, keep learning and that. keep experimenting and just open your eyes to what you've already got. I was told a long time ago, if you want to farm, you want to make $10,000, you have to do ten to $15,000 worth of work. Mm -hmm. 
you want to make thirty thousand, do fifty to sixty thousand dollars worth of work. Um, that being said, um, the advice I would pass on would be. Um, don't get so caught up in the farming that you lose track of what's going in and what's what's coming out in all aspects, not mm -hmm. just money, but ground. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Cause I feel like so many times we get, I mean, especially as I listen to Shannon get excited about certain flowers and I, and of course I tend to identify with that and be very much, Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Sweet peas. And you know, all that kind of stuff. And and you do, you have to keep track of that because you don't, you, you can lose your shirt really quickly and, mm -hmm. and not realize um, what's going on. So thank you for reminding us of that. And thank you guys so much for being on the flower podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> <laughs>